A PhD is the highest academic degree you can possibly earn. Those of you who are doing particularly well in your bachelor or master's degree will be considering doing a PhD at some point. And I'm sure you have plenty of questions about it. How can I prepare for the PhD? Is a PhD going to be of any use if I get a job in industry? What do I write in my PhD application statement? Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I am a professor at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Trinity College Cambridge. I have a PhD in computer science from Cambridge myself, and my job includes, among other things, admitting, advising, and examining students for the PhD degree. And I started doing that over 20 years ago, so I know a thing or two about this subject. In this series of videos, I gathered five brilliant first and second year undergraduate students of mine who are thinking they might one day do a PhD, and I spent a couple of hours with them answering their questions. The first video in this series is in the link up there, and you may hit the subscription bell to be notified when new ones come out. Okay, go for it. Um, I know that reading and writing academic paper is probably an important part of doing a PhD. So I wonder, is there any way for us to practice scientific writing or reading others' paper before we, go, we actually go to do a PhD so that we can be more prepared? You are certainly uh, absolutely right that uh, uh, reading and writing academic papers is a, an essential uh, part of doing a PhD. And um, in fact, it is more serious than, than people realize because um, even if you build a, a fantastic uh, system, after enough years, uh, nothing works software rots away, uh, and hardware stops running, and the only thing that remains is the paper that you've written uh, to a first approximation. And so, um, being able to communicate the advances that you have made in a way that is understandable by other people uh, um, is the thing that makes uh, advances in science. And it's absolutely a cornerstone of you becoming a member of this peer community of scientists that I, that I mentioned, for which the PhD is the entry ticket. So, um, if you are brilliant at what you do, but you're not able to communicate it effectively, then your, um, your success will be limited, will be hampered by this uh, lack in communication. So, it is absolutely uh, fundamental to become strong at that and the, the PhD is the best training and you have to I mean you were asking what was the way to choose a, a, a good PhD supervisor what this would be one of the things is this a person who writes papers I like to read or is this a person who writes papers that are totally incomprehensible and <laughs> I don't really feel inspired. I mean, I would end up learning from the person writing papers the way they write papers. So I want to learn how to write good papers, papers that uh, communicate clearly. The best papers are that there's something complicated, but it's explained so clearly that even I can understand, even though I'm not nowhere near as experienced in that field as that person who wrote it. And so that's a, a crucial skill to acquire. Now, the more junior you are, and the more you have to start by reading rather than writing. But the earlier you start writing and the better it is. Especially if you are in a situation where you can find someone more knowledgeable to give you feedback on what you wrote. So clearly the, uh, the master program is a um, situation where we make you take some baby steps towards that by having courses where it's not just um, a professor lecturing a class, but it's more a seminar style where, okay, here's a topic, uh, why don't you all read these papers, and then we talk about it, and you have to write an essay about what you got out of comparing these three papers, and you have to give a presentation about this, and so on and so on, and then there's a, an element of uh, criticizing and improving the form as well as the content. Okay, so you spoke about this thing, you, you talked about all the important things, but 
It was fairly nebulous because you didn't introduce the subject, you didn't explain why this was relevant, you didn't explain uh, what was hard about it, and blah, blah, blah. So that part is where you get insti institutionalized feedback on your presentation, on your, whether it's oral or, or written. Uh, and that's, that's useful. Of course, in, in the case of the PhD, when you do the PhD with the right supervisor for you, then you will be writing papers in first person and uh, co-authoring papers with someone who knows what they're doing, hopefully. And so they will say, okay, well, you've had this great idea, but if you're going to write a paper that's going to be accepted, then we need to express it in this way because people have to first realize that this thing will change the world. Uh, and if you write the way you've written it, uh, I mean, you follow your train of thought, but it doesn't really convey how serious this thing is. And so that will be a really a one-on-one -on -one, um, feedback on how to write with someone invested in that particular paper, maybe really because they're a co-author with you on that paper. Uh, in, in the case of the master, it's going to be a class which is more like, you know, a training. Okay, well, we're talking about something, and, and the topic is something that's generally in your interests, but it's not your paper you're writing. And you still practice writing, I say, and we're giving you feedback on how to write, how to communicate, and so on and so on, uh, in preparation for when you write your own papers. Uh, and before that, I mean, without even having any support from the the course structure. Uh, clearly, you can read as many papers as you like, um, and you can start making uh, making some um, internal ranking of which ones do I consider as uh, good papers or bad papers, content-wise, and which ones do I rank as good papers or bad papers uh, from a uh, presentation uh, aspect. And in between uh, just before the master, there's a, a kind of preview of the master courses in the final year of the Tribus here at Cambridge with the things called the units of assessment. The units of assessment were born as uh, master course classes that were then opened also to final year undergraduates. And so you may find a unit of assessment that is more uh, seminar style than a lecture course, and you have to... Um, as a kind of uh, assessment, not do an exam at the end, but instead write essays as you go through or stuff like that, uh, which is a bit like, you know, mini version of writing papers. And you may start doing that before the master if you take the right units of assessment in your third year. So that, that's the kind of progression. And besides that, uh, yeah, of course, we mentioned the summer internship. You can... The more enterprising you are, and the more things you can do on your own, including, um, you know, finding someone uh, to work with um, to write a paper, uh, not because the coursework requires you to produce a paper, but because there's a topic where uh, you have an idea and you've done some work, and uh, you're pairing up with one of the professors in the department to uh, try and have it published. And someone who's interested in what you're doing uh, might want to. Um, help you go through that. This makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Okay. Um, you have mentioned that during your time in the industry, you felt the importance of PhDs. Uh, that you felt like a sort of cog in the machine without having one yourself. Do you feel like the importance of PhDs is uh, as great overall in, in the industry of computer science, or was it? more of a specific case to the sort of work you were doing? And do you feel like it's going to change in the future? Um, so I think that for most computer science work, you don't really need to have a PhD. Uh, you, you, can do, you can have a very uh, satisfying and uh, high level career in computer science without having a PhD. Uh, you don't really need a PhD for most uh, software development jobs. If you are, if you want to be in a research environment in industry, then uh, if you want to be uh, involved in the research, you can still do that without having a PhD. If you want to be leading a part of the research, then it's unlikely they will let you do that without a PhD. Uh, what I felt in my personal situation was that I. Um, 
I would be allowed to work on an exciting project. Someone would tell me what to do. And if I said, I have this great idea and I would like uh, some people to work for me on, on implementing my idea, then I would not be able to uh, be given that responsibility without having a PhD myself. So basically, a PhD is a kind of, regardless of what you did your PhD in, the PhD is a bit of a trial by fire, which means this person has survived being thrown unknown problems at and then solving them, whatever it takes. Uh, and so I know that if I throw a new problem, which I don't know anything about and they don't know anything about because nobody's ever solved this problem, then they have what it takes to stick with it long enough that they then make some progress. And for that, I mean, I don't care if you had a PhD in physics or some other stuff that is completely unrelated to this computer science problem, but you have a PhD in, in some technical subject. You know, you've shown your competence once. I know you have the balls to do that again. I don't care what you did your PhD in because it's not the content. It's just the fact that you went through that process. So in that sense, for some role in uh, being a research leader, then it's necessary to have a PhD. Uh, for contributing to doing research, then it's not necessary. For doing interesting things in, 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 a, in a computer science environment, it's not necessary to have a PhD. If you want to, be the ideas guy and have the big vision and then have the credibility that uh, brings other people uh, to give you the responsibility to you know, hire people for your team and so on and so on. That, that, I think at that, at that level, that's where you need a PhD. Uh, I'll tell you another thing. So when I was still uh, in, uh, doing my master in engineering, I read a book uh, uh, by a guy called Arno Penzias, who was at the time the head of AT&T uh, research in, in, the, in the US, in, in the, the AT&T Bell Labs, the place that invented Unix and C and all that stuff. And that book uh, is something like uh, How to Live in a High-Tech World, or something like that. It was a fascinating book. And this guy was an astrophysicist. And I think he also got Nobel Prize, I'm not sure what it is, I think. Um, and he was a, a, a fascinating view of, you know, looking at the really hard, big things and, and leading a bunch of super clever people uh, to uh, do what they were best at. And I said, that's the kind of place where I want to work. Uh, and I don't care about getting a PhD. I, I don't want to do something exciting. And that, you know, working in Bell Labs, doing these things that, that they said, uh, AT&T was the place for me to be. So I wrote them a letter saying, I'm going to graduate next year. Uh, what do I need? Can I apply? Blah, blah, blah. And they sent me back a letter, which I still have somewhere. I don't know where it is. Uh, he said, ah, it's very nice, I mean, congratulations on your, on your excellent grades, uh, but unfortunately, we only take researchers from the PhD in this place, in AT&T Bell Labs. I said, oh, shit. Uh, I didn't want to do a PhD, so I, said, I, I filed it away, so I'm like, okay, well, not too bad. But uh, there are places where, you know, your entry ticket is a PhD, uh, even in, in industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. The place where I ended up working here in Cambridge, it was not an entry ticket, it was about half and half with and without PhD. Uh, but I could see, after living in that context for several years, that uh, there was a top tier that was only reserved for people with a PhD, basically the research leaders. And I wanted to become one of those. And that's why I went back and did it. Yeah, fair. Thank you very much. OK. OK. <laughs> so, yeah, perhaps at a more sort of concrete level, I guess because the applications are starting soon and all that sort of thing. On statements of purpose, because I'm aware you have to write essentially a statement of purpose for a PhD application, do you have any tips for writing these things, sort of compared to, say, writing personal statements at the undergraduate level? Sort of, to what extent do you, yeah, and also sort of how does this relate to your own your own research interests and your own long term plan versus that of your supervisor and such. I think that if you are going at a uh, at a high enough uh, level, at a serious enough level, I mean, if you are applying for a PhD in a place like uh, the computer lab here at Cambridge or something equivalent to that, you know, top places in the world. I don't think it matters that much what you write in those statements. What matters is the facts. What have you done? First of all, have you always got consistently high marks in your academic career? Uh, then, have you done anything interesting when you had a chance to do it? Uh, I mean, have you 
whenever there was a chance to publish something, have you published something? If you have published something, where have you published something? How many have you done and where, where were they published? And uh, is it actually something that makes any sense? Uh, the top people who uh, apply and get in basically unconditionally are the ones who show that they've already done the kind of stuff that we would want them to do. So don't worry so much what you write in the statement. Actually do stuff that will convince us that you are the right person. Uh, there are a few years before you apply, and how do you spend those years? That will show us who you are. So someone who just goes through the motion, cracks the hand, and so on, and writes a statement is different from someone who is like, they're living it like it's the last year of their life. I want to do this, I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we see people who ended up, you know, that's surprising, I mean, getting to that stage, such an uh, early stage in their career, and you already have, you know, uh, you've already published two papers and there's another one in the pipeline, so I, I pay attention. I mean, I may not even understand what the paper is about, but I kind of see this as a sign of being enterprising. Uh, and it doesn't have to be just papers, it can be other things, you know. Yeah, I've uh, uh, I've interned in a famous place and I've done X there, uh, and I've uh, um, I think that the less formulaic and more uh, unique to you things, so long as they are relevant, uh, are going to say a lot more than anything you could write in the statement. I mean, I'm saying that unique to you things, I mean, if you've, uh, uh, if you've gone up the Everest uh, without oxygen and so on, it's all very nice, but it doesn't really matter for applying for computer science, even if it's an exceptional thing that only a few people in the world know. So I don't care about that. Anyway, you can do the Rubik's Cube in two seconds. I don't care. But, uh, you've done things that are exceptional in the context of the people who apply. I mean, maybe only uh, five people out of a hundred who apply uh, will have done that kind of stuff. In terms of computer science achievement for that level, then we are going to pay a lot more attention to that than to anything that you write in prose about, uh, you know, my interest is in blah, blah, blah. I don't want to know what you want. I want to know what you've done. Make sense? Right. So, yeah. so it matters less the sort of specific what is your research vision? And it's still more selecting on what have you actually done as opposed to like, right. do you have a, do you have a very concrete, justifiable plan for like, where your research is going to go? Uh, where your research is going to go, uh, like over the next three matters years. to some extent. What, what actually matters in that statement is, have you got a clue about research and have you started doing your homework on that? So, if you say, uh, I'd like to work in artificial intelligence, because everybody says that anyway. Uh, we don't give a shit. Okay, you like to work in artificial intelligence. Everybody and their dog likes to work in artificial intelligence. So that carries zero information and certainly doesn't advance you in the ranking in any way. Uh, if you, however, say, you know, I would like to do that particular thing because this is a problem that is still unsolved. I think it's a problem that is of a size I could actually address myself. Uh, I don't think uh, it's like uh, P equals MP, because I understand it would be stupid for me to propose that I become a PhD student on trying to solve P equals MP. Uh, but I think this particular aspect of this particular thing that I want to do, say for a sake of artificial intelligence, because it really wants to do that, uh, it's not just a generic bandwagon topic. It's one particular thing where I've developed an interest in this, and I've read these various papers, and I cite the papers that I've read, and I see that there's there's something none of them has, a, has actually tried, and I would like to try that. Uh, and if I tried that, I think it would make an advance in this way. And if, if my hunch is correct, then it would provide this benefit, which is not provided by any of the existing systems. So now then, if I were someone who understands anything about artificial intelligence, which is not the case, uh, then I would be able to assess how much of this preliminary analysis you've done is actually sensible, and how much you've missed out on crucial other things in the field. And I can say, well, this guy has just repeated buzzwords, or this guy has actually gone in and looked at stuff and has found, intelligently found, the most relevant things about that part that, that, that he wants to investigate. So, so this is a smart cookie. I want to work with this guy because uh, on his own, he found out that of all the thousands of papers that have been published in the last 10 years about this topic, the important ones are this, this, and this, and he correctly identified the bit that they're all missing. And 
he points out what he wants to do, and that actually makes a lot of sense. So you don't have to promise how you're going to solve it, because otherwise you would have already finished the PhD and it wouldn't be researched. But you know, if you show that you have done some background um, preparation in a sensible way, that already gives me a feeling that you are, um, how to say, you're ready to do research because you've started in the right way. I mean, you, you've done the right kind of thing that you would have to learn to do in your first year if you if you're starting from zero. And the more you've already shown a drive and an interest and an ability to do that, and the more I will think you are ready to do a PhD well. You hit the ground running if you already started that way. And that's probably um, less than 20% of people who come up with uh, a sensible statement in that way. So that would of the things that you could write in the statement, doing something which shows you've already started doing the the groundwork in seeing what other people have done, what they have missed, uh, what the thing you want to do would improve on what everybody else has done, and why do you think nobody else has managed to make progress in there and you think you have a chance, then that, 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 I think that's the best thing you could write in a uh, statement, I don't know, statement, whatever it's called, project proposal, and so on. Um, none of this commits you to doing that for the duration of the PhD. I mean, if I if I find someone who sends me a statement like the one we've just been talking about, and I say, I, I want this guy because finally there's someone uh, who doesn't just blab about what they like, uh, says, I've actually looked into the problem. And I have charted a path for what I want to do. Well, I think that's the right attitude. I actually care what you want to do. Uh, I, I care that you're going to be uh, not wasting your time in uh, looking for solutions in, in a sensible way. And the fact that you've already done this homework gives me reassurance that you're going to be uh, uh, a stimulating person to work with. Now, you do that, okay, and I and, and if I admit you for a PhD, then I will give you some problem to work on for your first few months, and we'll see how you make progress on that, and maybe that will give you ideas of doing something different, and maybe as we go along, by the end of your first year, you say, well, I've, I've tried this thing, I've tried this other thing, I've tried this other thing, and I found that now that I've you know, been embedded in this field for a year, I discovered there are some other thing that's first a lot more challenging, second a lot more interesting for me than the thing I originally said when I submitted my application. I, I'd like to work on that. And, and then your first year report that you have to submit to be allowed to continue with a PhD instead of just being kicked out with a certificate of postgraduate studies or whatever it's called for people who just don't make the grade out of the first year. Uh, then uh, in that plan you can say now what I'm going to do for the core of my PhD is going to be this other thing, which is somewhat different from what I said, and nobody's going to mind. I mean, we're happy that you've now understood enough about the field to make a more informed decision, because we don't expect you to be an expert in the field when you're still applying uh, for a PhD place. So uh, it's important to do as good background research as you can for that statement, but it's not something that will then commit you to doing that necessarily, if you find out that it's something more interesting, or that that's a dead end, that, it, that didn't work the way you thought. Right, so so I guess it's like, if, if you have that statement, and you have something, say, you're more, an area you're sort of more well-versed in, even if you may want to sort of pivot to sort of some other related area later, you should probably focus on a statement centering around the first area, and then sort of move, I guess, when you're in, as opposed to? Well, as far as what to write in the statement, mm. uh, to the extent that the statement has any influence on the selection process, I would write a statement that shows evidence of having uh, understood what research is about. Right. Uh, and then the content of the research is secondary and it is possible to change later. Of course, the later you change to something else and the less time you have to finish uh, within uh, your deadlines, 
we then having done in a fortnight. If you change at the end of your second year, then you only go one year left to do the research and then write that. And so, uh, and I, uh, the the length of uh, what is a sensible time, there's going to be some boundary set by uh, by uh, the university. Certainly, if you if you take uh, absurdly long time, like in five or six years, you will be deregistered. You just and you will be considered a failure for the department, even if you end up then getting a PhD after 10 years or whatever. You still get your PhD, but as far as the department, that student was a failure. Okay, we are marked down for this and you know, get bad points for when to uh, get new funding and so on. Uh, the, as I said, the minimum is nine terms, uh, which would allow you to finish in less than three years. Uh, and the, uh, the sensible, the normal thing is uh, three and a half years, uh, and I think up to four years uh, more or less every funder will be happy. You have to check with whatever funder is, is supporting you. Uh, then at some point you will run out of money if you keep going. Uh, and then it is still possible to say, well, anyway, I'll, I'll keep uh, you know, uh, eating only potatoes and, and paying out of my own pocket uh, and living under a bridge until I submit, uh, even if I have run out of funding. And until you get to the stage where you're deregistered, uh, that's also okay. But it would be highly desirable to finish within the terms of uh, whatever your funding agreement says. And so that says, if you pivot to another topic very late, then you have less time to do something worth writing about, because you, you spent the previous years on something else, and so there's not much left for you to make a break in, in the new thing. That okay? I hope you found this video useful, and if you did, then please give it a thumbs up. If you have any further PhD related questions we haven't covered, stick them in the comments and insert the emoji of a mortar board cap in your comment if you want to increase the probability that I will answer it soon, which I might do as a thank you for your having watched till the end. The next video in this series will be linked from here. Thank you again for watching, and I look forward to welcoming you to the next video.